Amen. You may be seated. In the name of the Lord, shine the light to Canaan. Shine the light to Canaan. If I could draw your attention to these verses of Jesus talking, very interesting discussion that Jesus is having. Several things for us to look at just to jump in to what Jesus is talking about. In verse 34, he says, your eye is the lip of your body, and when your eyes are healthy, your whole body also is full of light, but when they are unhealthy, your body also is full of darkness. I mean, we could take that passage and apply it naturally before we even apply it spiritually or, or, or supernaturally. Uh, in essence, that your, your eye's sensitivity to light is a sign of how healthy your eyes are. Whether or not your eyes are healthy, uh, one of the ways that it's de it can be determined is how sensitive they are to light. I know that me and glasses, I've only been wearing glasses now for a little more than a year. And it's like I have them on and I take them off. And quite honestly, I, I, I can't really see far. And, but close, I don't need them. And so I'm just, and, and I, I, when I take them off, y'all are kind of blurry. But then I, I'm looking down. It's just getting used to them. I'm still getting used to them. Part of the way that I knew that I needed glasses was stuff just was dark. I just, I, I, I'd go to see a movie and somebody would say, how did you like it? And I would just, I'd say, it's, it was dark to me. Was it dark? Did I, I felt like it was dark. One of the ways that you know that your eyes aren't working all that well is if you're scared to drive at night. You're not just, oh, you need to get your eyes checked. Uh, you, need to, you need to get somebody to check your eyes because if your eyes are not as sensitive to light, when was the last time you got your eyes checked? Good God, everybody going to be coming on Sunday with glasses on. I, because I never wore glasses, I didn't get my eyes checked a whole lot. I'm sure I told you all the story I, how I found out I needed glasses quite accidentally. One of my sons wears glasses, and he came in with his shirt off because he was 18. 18-year-olds 18 always have their shirt off because their body looks good. Hallelujah. And so he came in, his glasses were dirty, and I said, hand them to me. And I cleaned his glasses, and I, I tried them on, and the world went from analog to HD, God. And I realized there was a, there was a window in a rental house, and there was a window up high that the whole time we were in the rental house, I thought that was frosted glass when I put them glasses on. And I could see clear through it. There's trees on the other side that I, I found out because my eyes had gone bad over time just, just to bring it all in. Maybe it isn't really dark. Maybe it's your eyes. Maybe things aren't as dark, but... Maybe it's your eyes. I don't know if you've ever had to find your way in the dark. And, you know, I, I hunt, hallelujah, hunting seasons coming. Thank you, Jesus. And, and a part of what happens is you're going into the dark or you're coming out in the dark. You got little lights, but, but it, it's already dark. I don't need my eyes to be bad as well. It's already dark. I don't need bad eyes too. There's already confusion. There's already a question as to what is the way that I should take and how do I get from here to there? And, and Lord, what exactly are you saying to me? And there's this promise of Canaan, but what way should I take? And, and am I going in the right direction? There's already enough darkness. There's already enough ambiguity I don't need my eyes to be bad as well. There's already enough question. There's already enough debate. The last thing I need is debate and my eyes are bad. Last thing I need is darkness and my eyes are bad. My last, my last year of hunting without glasses, I mean, I only killed maybe a deer or two that whole year. And, uh, and I just was so frustrated. I just didn't see any deer. I was, I don't know what happened. These coyotes, I was just complaining. I didn't even see any deer. Did you see any deer? Until I got glasses. Once I got, I realized they were probably walking right by me. It's, it's already, there's already camouflage. It's already dark. You don't need bad eyes to go along with the ambiguity that life already brings. Jesus takes it even further because in verse 36, Jesus says something, and beloved, I've read the Bible through several times. This passage, very familiar to me, 
But for whatever reason, maybe it's the way the NIV has stated it here, or I just wasn't paying attention. I don't know if I really have ever seen this verse as fully as I'm seeing it today, because Jesus says something really interesting in verse 36, in which he says, therefore, if your whole body is full of light and no part of it is dark, it will be just as full of light as when a lamp shines its light on you. So he's saying that, that if, you're, if the light within you is darkness, <laughs> that, that really there's, there's almost nothing worse than darkness within. Darkness within is worse than darkness without. Darkness without is already challenging enough. Ambiguity out without is already challenging enough. There's a debate tonight, last night the debate, another debate tonight, the Democratic candidates are debating, and there's so many of them. I don't know if you say, there's just so many of them. I can't wait till it's down to two or three. It's just too, it's like a shuffling of deck of cards. It's just, it's 80 people right now. It's everybody and their grandmama's trying to take Trump off. And I, I just, I mean, I'm trying to pay attention. I'm trying, there's, there's so many, half of them I don't know. There's already enough ambiguity without it's the last thing I need is darkness within last thing I need is to be lost inside of me to be disconnected even from my own purpose and disconnected even from my own calling and disconnected e even from my own identity it's hard enough figuring out the identity of the different democratic candidates if I don't even know who I am it's hard enough figuring out which way to take if I don't even know what's going on on the inside of me that he's saying that if you can get the light on the inside together, the light on the inside is the same as if there's light on the outside. Meaning that, that, that if, if the light within you gets fixed, even if you're walking through a dark place, the light on the inside can shine so brightly that outer dark don't bother you. Good God. Anybody sleep with a night light when you were younger? I need a witness. Be honest, be honest. Anybody sleep longer with a night light than you care to admit? Nobody want to say amen on that one. Anybody still sleep with one? You still, you got your TV on. Don't lie. The devil is a lie. You got your TV on when you go to sleep. There's a light. I, I understand it. I get it because there's something about darkness that can make us uncomfortable, especially if the light within is not right. When the inner light is lit, it's the same as the outer light. That if you can get your inner light together... If you come to a service like this or anybody's service or watch anybody or anybody's stream and as a result of that, you see revelation. If, if as a result of my teaching or anyone's teaching that you listen to, you end up saying, man, the word just makes sense when Joyce Meyer speaks and the word just makes sense when, when Joel Olsen, and where just makes sense when Jake speaks. The word just makes sense when Judas Smith speaks. If that, in essence, what the word, what, what, what Jesus is saying is, that's great, but that's also a sign that your inner light is not as lit as it needs to be. Because if you could ever get your inner light together, then your inner light will shine just as brightly as when an outer light shines on you. The only time you feel the Holy Ghost is when you come here together. That means that when the light of this moment shines and whoa, you feel God, hallelujah. But Jesus is saying, yeah, but if you could ever get your inner light on, then the inner light can be just as strong as the outer light. And that really, he's laying down a gauntlet for us, for us to get the inner light. In other words, and I'll throw this on the screens for you, he's saying wisdom from the inside is, is good just like wisdom from the outside is good. Wisdom from the outside is amazing, but wisdom from the inside Wisdom can come from within if you get your light lit. 
Wisdom from the inside can happen. And for all of us that get light from the inside and the outside, woo, it's even more powerful when you hear a word that confirms something that was going on on the inside. It's even greater when you come to church or you hear someone or someone says something to you and it confirms on the outside something that you already was hearing on the inside. There's something powerful when you get a confirmation of something that your gut is telling you and you realize that your inner man is lit. Praise God for wisdom from without, and I'm open to wisdom from without. I'm open to give it. I'm open to receive it, but I'm also equally excited about the possibility that if I find myself by myself, I can hear the Lord talk to me. If I find myself by myself, I can get some clarity and get some direction. And even if it's dark on the outside, there's a light on the inside of me that can shine the way. I wish I had a witness. That can bring clarity to my situation and can say, all right, this is the way to go. Because I would, con I would uh, argue that one of the most frustrating things to happen to an individual is to get lost. I know today, because of GPS, we don't even know nothing about getting lost. But back in the day, you used to get lost. Nobody want to say amen. Back, old people talk to me. Back in the day, somebody wrote down directions. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Somebody told you on the phone how to get there. And they didn't even know street names. They would tell you, come down to the third street. You're going to see a dog scratching in the yard. And you're going to tell you, what's the name of the street? Girl, I don't know the name of the street. We, you didn't even know. You just had to figure it out. And then you get lost and pull over and call from a pay phone. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Somebody have to get in their car. Where are you? At the wall. Stay right there. I'm going to come pick you up. And you follow them in because nothing is more frustrating than getting lost. One of the worst arguments me and that girl in the front row got into. We was, we was engaged. Help us, Holy Ghost. And we were finding this little, this, this little hall that we could afford with our little nickels. We was running together, rubbing together. We found this little hall and she was, oh, we're going to go see this hall. And the directions that they gave us and, and we stopped three times. Finally, I stopped. The fourth time I stopped, I went to the gas station. I asked them, tell me how to get back to Dorchester. How do I get back home? I just went to the house. She's like, where are we going? I said, home, because I don't like being lost. I want to know where I am. Nothing more frustrating than not knowing what direction to go in. I need a witness in the building. Nothing more frustrating than knowing where you want to go, but not knowing how to get there. Nothing more frustrating than knowing what you want, but don't know how to do it. Nothing more frustrating than having it all, but somehow you're losing it, and you don't know what to do to keep it. That is darkness on the outside. And when that darkness is on the outside, you got to get some kind of light on the inside. You can't just get light from other people. you got to get a light that comes from within. I need a witness in the building. All right, with all of that in mind, we look at John chapter 1 and verse 1. And in John chapter 1, verse 1, he just says a bunch of stuff. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. So the first point, I'll just throw it up there really quickly, that John is making is that Jesus equals the Word. Jesus and the Word are the same thing. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was the same, was in the beginning with God. He was with God in the beginning. That another name for Jesus is the Word. All things were made by Him. I know the Scripture by heart, but I know in the King James Version. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Second point is that everything was made by Him. Everything was made by the Word. On Sundays, we've been talking a lot about your words having power, and God has exalted every, above everything His name and His Word, and how powerful words are, and how much you got to watch what you say. Part of the reason why the Lord has said it that way is because everything that we have was made by the Word. He spoke it into existence. He said, let there be light, and there was light. So, of course, our words have power if everything was made by the Word. And I will contend that everything you have right now has been created by your words. 
And if you're unhappy, it's because your mouth has created a situation that has caused you to now be in an unhappy place. If you are lacking, it's because your mouth has made a world full of lack. That everything was made by him, everything was made by the word, that in Christ, in the word, in him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, that in Christ, in the word is life. In Christ, in the word is life. You don't have a relationship with Christ if you don't have a relationship with his word. In Christ, in the word is life. Don't let me know to get ahead of myself. And that life equals light. That life is the light of all mankind. That life is the light of men. I love the fact that it's not just the light of Christians. It's the light of all mankind. That in him was life, and that life was the light of all men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. So the word inside equals life inside, which equals light inside. The word inside, which is Jesus inside, I don't know if you remember when I was younger, we used to sing this little song that says, I've got Jesus in my heart, in my heart, in my heart. I've got the love of Jesus in my H-E-A-R-T. I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart, in my heart, into my heart. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Jesus in your heart means the word in your heart, means life in your heart means light in your heart. It means light on the inside. Because the point I'm trying to make, and I said it already because I got ahead of myself, is that a relationship with Jesus equals a relationship with his word. A relationship with Jesus equals a relationship with his, with his word. Meaning that if you're in here tonight and you think you know Jesus and you don't know any of his word, you don't really know Jesus. Got quiet. If you're in here today and you're saying, I'm a Christian because I've got Jesus in my heart, awesome. One of the things that has to happen is, can't just have Jesus in your heart and not get some word in your heart. The word in your heart lights a light. And if there's darkness within, it's because we ain't got enough word in. Because the word turns into life and the life turns into light. Come on, Wednesday night, talk to me. Word turns into life. The life turns into light. It's more than just a prayer. It's more than just coming to the front, praying a prayer. Praise God for that. Hallelujah. But I can't lay hands on you and get light inside. The way for you to get light inside is you're going to have to leave out of here, and you're going to have to get that buck. And you're going to have to figure out, how do I get that book in here? Because light comes from life, and life comes from the Word. The Word and Christ are the same. And so, I, I just want to say really quickly, let me, let me just make this point. Ways for the Word to get in you. I'm going to throw this, some, some thoughts up. You can take notes if you're taking notes. Ways for the Word to get in you, all right? First way for the Word to get in you is what's happening today, that you are prot and taught the Word. That word prot is actually a word. It's kind of a past tense word for preaching. You are preached. The Word is preached to you. You are prot the Word, and you are taught the Word. If you don't think it's an actual word, it is a word. Prot and taught the Word. Preaching and teaching. Preaching's not enough. There's got to be some inspiration, but there also has to be some instruction. That's why I make everybody stand for the Word. That's why I make everybody read the Word. That's why nine times out of ten, I take us to a familiar passage of Scripture. Because I want to preach so many, I want to preach the passages so much that you start to know them. I'm not interested in impressing you with my knowledge of deep theological thought in some obscure passage that you never heard before. 
especially when there's so much to apply right from stuff we know. So one of the first ways that the Word gets in you is somebody preaches the Word to you, somebody teaches the Word to you, which is one of the reasons why we can struggle with darkness within because we don't go to church like we should. Amen, chairs. We, we kind of come, and we really come when we're in trouble, and, we, and we, we, we get a little, and oh, I was there last week, so I'm good. And, and we, we can't, no, no, no shade, man. We just can't be surprised when all of a sudden there is a barrenness and a darkness within, and we ain't even been around the Word that much. That we, you, you, you are pro, you're preaching and teaching, you need to get a Bible, you need to get some kind of journal. You need to take some kind of notes. Especially when you come here. Because I'm going to throw some ideas on the screens. I'm not up here going, ah, because God can't, ah. I'm not doing that. I'm trying to systematically break some stuff down for you to write some stuff down because how will you remember it if you don't write it down? Oh, I need a witness in the building. It's not, I mean, I'm not knocking that because I can do that every now and then. It does come over me. And I do start saying, oh, because God can do it. I say, yeah, sure, it's great. And that's, that's more preaching than teaching. You need both. You need to be inspired and instructed. Oh, but you need to write. Everybody ought to be saying, oh, okay, let me write. Okay, preaching and teaching, let me write that down. Your brain holds stuff when you write it. Everybody needs to get some kind of journal. Everybody needs to be taking some kind of notes because preaching and teaching is one of the main words, ways that you get the Word in you. Another way that you get the Word in you is repetition. Repetition. You just say the Word over and over to yourself. Get a passage of Scripture and speak it over to yourself. You play it to yourself over and over. You get the C, get the message, you get the C, get the DVD, and you play it over and over to yourself. That's how you know the music you know. That's how you know the lyrics to Rapper's Delight. That's how you know the lyrics to whatever kind. That's how you know the lyrics to whoever you listen to. God help you. Yeah, because you are, you're, you're, you're playing that repetitively over and over to yourself. And you have to be careful because if you are repetitively, repetitively playing stuff into you and not getting any word in you repetitively to balance that out, then the inside becomes more darkness than light. There's a battle on the inside between darkness and light. And if you let darkness speak to you more than light, then you end up more full of dark than you end up full of light. And so you got to play some stuff on a regular basis, not just gospel songs, but, but some word that you play over and over to yourself. You read the Word. That's another way for the Word to get in you. Good God. You read the Word. You get a good reading plan. I used to go through a whole big thing on a reading plan. I don't even have to do that anymore. The Internet has made it easy. You can go to Bible Gateway or you can go. There's so many different apps that you can go to that will take you through a reading plan in which you read the Bible in a year or two years or whatever, but you got to take some time to read the Bible. Don't shout me down for preaching to the good. Amen, light bulbs. You got to take some time, even if it's just three times a week for 10 minutes. That's better than reading it for two hours on a Saturday and not picking the Bible up again till 2020. It's like working out. It'd be better for you to go work out for 20 minutes, three days a week, than to work out for two hours till you saw and never go to the gym again. I need a witness in the building. I know you got a gym membership that you're paying for, and you don't go. Doesn't make any sense for you to read the Bible for two hours and then not read it again for another year. I'd rather give you something that you can actually do. Can't read every day. Read every other day. Amen. Amen. Wednesday night. Pick the Bible up and read it because it's a part of the way that the Word gets in you, and then you got to memorize some Scripture. You memorize. You meditate. You memorize. You meditate. Meditating means chew the cud. Meditating means that you think about the word instead of thinking about evil thoughts. 
Help us, Holy Ghost. You get some word in you, and you think on that word, and you think on that thing, and you get that stuff on the inside of you. That's the way that the word gets in you. Last seven minutes. How does it bless me? All right, PA, if I'm preached and word is preached and teached to me and I, and I repetitively get the word in me and I start reading the word and I start, I start memorizing the word and meditating on the word, what does it do? How does it get this light on? One of the great things about the word and especially what I'm saying to you is that there's so many benefits to getting in the word. Benefit number one. The first thing is that the Word brings life. Word brings life. The Word of God itself is alive. Bible says the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, sharpened enough to dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. What that means is that the Word of God is like a living thing that settles where you need it. It speaks to your heart. It speaks to my heart. Two of us can read the exact same passage and hear two totally different things. God help us. Both of us can read the exact same passage and come out saying, oh, my God, this is what the Word said to me. I can't tell you how many times I've said it ad infinitum, but it bears repeating. How many times somebody will come up to me and tell me something I said that I did not say. I've gone back and played the tape. And I said, I never said that. And they said, yes, you did. I said, no, what happened is the Holy Ghost took what you heard and made it apply to you. Now you got me saying something that the Holy Ghost said. Because the Word of God is alive. It's a living thing. It brings life. It doesn't just touch one thing. It touches a lot of stuff. Especially if you pray before you read it and say, Lord, open my eyes that I can see something in your word. And then you'll be reading and it speaks to you. And you're, and you're just hearing it talk to your heart. And, and, and you're reading the word of God. It is alive. It brings life. It's not a dead book. It's a living book. It's a living epistle. The second benefit to it is it helps me recognize God's voice. It helps me recognize God's voice. There's nothing like recognizing the voice of the Father. Nothing like it. Nothing like having someone whose voice you recognize. My cousin is here with his kids and, you know, basically more nephews and nieces and nephews. And they, they wanted to, they were trying to wake up Robert. Robert's downstairs, sleep. You know, teenagers sleep like vampires in the day like they're dead. They're trying to get him to turn something on or whatever. And I said, go down there and wake him up. They're shaking him. They're shaking his leg. He's dead. He's asleep. I said, I'll go down there. All I had, as soon as my feet hit the bottom of the basement and I said his name, he turned around because he know when I call him, he better turn over. There's something about recognizing that voice and some of us don't recognize the voice of God because we don't read enough words. Recognize God's voice. We don't get in the Word enough. When you read the Word of God, that's why I have you read it out loud. That's why I got us reading it so that you hear it in your own head. Because when you hear it in your own head, then you start hearing the voice of God in your head. And you start hearing the Holy Ghost say, shut up. I wish I had a witness. You start hearing the Holy Ghost say, don't say that. Don't tell him that. You start hearing the Holy Ghost say, no, 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 don't, don't do that right now. Don't commit to that. But we don't hear that voice enough because we're not in the Word enough. Amen. Word of God gets the voice of God active, and it gets you hearing stuff inside from hearing the Word. Number three, the third benefit of the Word of God. It's great. Almost done. Third benefit of reading the Word and studying the Word and getting into the Word is that it judges me privately. It judges me privately. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of my heart, meaning that I can get corrected without everybody knowing. 
Now, I don't know if you have been corrected by being embarrassed. Oh, Jesus. Embarrassed corrected is worse than private corrected. My mom came to school one time. I only had to have her come once. When she came in, I know she intentionally didn't even hardly fix herself up just to make me never want to have her come up there ever again. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. People are saying, whose mom is that? I'm just putting my head down. It's, there is something about being corrected in front of everybody. And oh, if folk could just have the clarity before the scandal that they have after it. Oh, if we could just get in the Word and get stuff fixed before everybody knows our dirt. Oh, help us, Holy Ghost. I know I'm not the only one who had some stuff, and you got it together before the world found out. Oh, I need a witness in the building. The Word says God will give you space to change. He'll give you space to get stuff together if you'll get it together. The thing about the Word of God is that the Word of God judges me and everybody don't have to know that I got judged because I judged myself by the Word. The Word judges me before my exposure. Number four, I'm almost done. The fourth way that the Word blesses me is it brings wisdom. Brings wisdom. If you're in this room and you have a tendency to say things that aren't that smart, you need to read the Word more. Help us, Holy Ghost. You're in this room, and people are saying, what were you thinking? Then you need to read the Word more. I'm telling you, you start reading that Word, you start getting that Word in there, and people start thinking, you are smart. You start quoting Scripture and quoting the Word and saying stuff. If you don't know what you're talking about, get into the Word. That's true for any book, not just the Word of God. If you, you're not that bright, because you need to read. Help us, Holy Ghost. You need to get in that, get in the sun, get in some kind of books and start reading some thoughts besides just your own. Only listening to your own thoughts does not make you smart. Your mind is expanded by reading what somebody else thinks. Getting into the Word, especially, brings a wisdom. I see the world differently after I read the Word. There's a wisdom that I have as a result of getting into the Word. And then the fifth thing that the Word does is it testifies. It testifies. The Word testifies. I know I'm not the only one. Grew up in a church where people say, believe I testify while I had a chance, because I mean I had a chance no more, and launch into their testimony. I remember testimony service. I remember testimony service. Some testimony services were great. Some, some of them. But a part of what a testimony is supposed to do is it's supposed to make somebody say, wow, look what the Lord has done. After service was over on Sunday, a woman was sitting on the second row. She was a first-time visitor. She came up to me afterwards and told me how the doctors gave her two weeks to live with terminal cancer. They told her, there's nothing we can do for you. You're going to die in two weeks. She said, the first week, she was just sad. And then her cousin came to her and said, I want you to go to church with me tonight. And she was like, well, okay. And she'll just go. And she went to church, and there was some preacher there and he said there's somebody in here who the doctor said you're going to die in two weeks from cancer but you can get healed today and she came to the front and they laid hands on her and she said I'm healed and she went to the doctor and the doctor said what did you do oh, I need a witness in the building the Lord can still he, he's a way maker he's a miracle work he's a promise keeper She said, Jesus. He said, I don't know about Jesus, but whatever you did, don't stop doing whatever you did. It's a testimony. I sat right there and let her tell the whole thing. Tears coming to my eyes because I know God can do anything but fail. And it just helps sometimes to find somebody that has a testimony. 
to find somebody that I can relate to. Their promises become mine. I start claiming their promise. Good God, help us. I don't know if you was young and you see a nice car and you'd be like, my car, that's my car. Y'all be arguing, that's my car, that's my car. And the same way, I read the word and I'm like, that, no, that's my promise. Uh-uh. Back up, that's mine. No, no, that's mine. That Joshua stuff, that's my promise. That is mine. It belongs to me. There is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he certainly can do for you. God is not a respecter of persons. I speak that over. God is not a respecter of persons. And if I find somebody with victory in the Bible, then I can say, whoa, I'm claiming that. And I relate to them. Amen. Testimonies strengthen identification. They get me into being, not just acting. I find somebody and I say, okay, I'm going to do what Joshua did, and I'm going to see what happens. I'm going to walk like they walked. I'm going to walk in their testimony. I'm going to identify with Christ. I'm going to identify with Moses. I'm going to identify with Samson. Help us. I'm going to identify with David, Lord. I'm going to identify with Boaz. I'm going to identify with Ruth. I'm going to identify with Esther. I'm going to identify with these people. I'm going to identify with Jacob. I'm going to wonder, do I identify more with Jacob or with Esau? Amen. Who am I more like? Am I selling out my birthright for a bowl of stew? Who can, when I read the word and I see their testimony, it makes me say, God, look at how you move. And I'm filled with a confidence that knows, a confidence within that knows that this thing works. Anybody believe it works? This thing works. That the Word works, the kingdom works, that Christ works, the relationship with Him works, that prayer works. I start to identify with it because I see testimonies of folk in the Word that I say, wow, okay, I can identify with them. We start talking Canaan, I can identify with Joseph. I can identify with that. I identify with their testimony, and their testimony strengthens my identity in Christ. And a light gets turned on. And that light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. If you're believing God for a light that darkness cannot overcome, put your hands together really quickly. Hallelujah. Anybody hear a word from the Lord tonight? Jump on your feet. Reach out. Grab your neighbor's hand. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for a light within. Thank you for light within. Father, light the way. Be our present help. You're our God. Thank you for light within. Not just light from without, but light from within. God, I pray that we will prioritize your word, that we will hear your word, that we'll read your word, and we'll start to study your word, start to meditate on your word, and start to memorize your word, and, and that, God, we'll be known as people of the word, and we'll get wisdom from the word, and get correction from the word, and that we'll, we'll understand the power of the word of God. We'll apply the word, walk in the light that it shines on us. Thank you for living so big in us tonight. Thank you for this group that gathered together. Thank you for the group that's watching live around the world. Have your way in us. Be God in our situation. We'll be your people. Surrender our lives to your will and to your way. Have your way in us. And we'll bless you. Dismiss us from this place, but never from your presence. Cover us with your blood as we leave, as we go home, as we as we. So fellowship with one another, anoint us. Thank you for angels that are around us. Keep us in all of our ways. Thank you that tomorrow, God, something's going to happen. We're believing, God. Something's going to happen. Somebody invested some time tonight. Something's going to happen. Something special, supernatural happens when we call on your name. Have your way in us. God, as we always pray, let the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight. For God, you're our rock and our redeemer. We love you. In Jesus' name, we all sit together. Amen. God bless you. Greet somebody in the name of the Lord. Give somebody a hug.